keywords and metadata, but also what call to action you might want to put in your creative and how you prioritize one feature over another. So using the right data is important and don't settle for what you think is working. Mm -hmm. Always question whether you can do more. It's important when you're thinking about SEO uh, to understand that, that a, the concept of App Store optimization you know, is similar. You want to improve your conversion. You want to rank for more keywords. You want to improve your organics. Um, but the process here really isn't the same. And we really don't like to say that you know, ASO is app SEO. It's incredibly misleading. Um, you have to think about, in the ASO world, how visibility for your app extends beyond the keywords that you target. Um, on Google, if you pay attention to your rankings on a day-to-day -day basis, you'll see that they change from one day to the next. Why is that? That doesn't happen with the web. Um, you know, search suggestions on the App Store and Google Play, even anecdotally, if you're typing in keywords on your phone inside the App Store and Play Store, searching, um, the results are gonna differ from the web. There's a good reason for that. Uh, and you know, one of the things that we always like to highlight is that you know, A-B testing is one thing to improve conversion, but keyword optimization is another thing. And keywords are not meant to be cycled through like an A-B test every few days uh, for, from an organic perspective. You have to let things index. Um, so uh, we're gonna cover all these things. So one, when we think about App Store optimization at Gummy Cube, we think of it like a retail experience. We think of it like e-commerce, not like web search optimization. Right, there are aisles, and depending on where you are in the aisle, when you, whether you're you know, eye height or, or very high or very low, you're gonna get more or less traction. There are pop-ups, which are you know, kind of uh, you know, a way to highlight uh, a product or highlight an app. Um, and then there are end caps, which in the, the mobile world is, is like Apple search ads, where you're buying a placement um, to be featured. So, this starts to look very familiar uh, when you look at e-commerce, when you compare the App Store and Play Store to Amazon. Uh, there are feature graphics. There are recommendations for what customers also bought. You can see what customers also viewed and even see sponsored results. And uh, next time you look at the web, you notice that, uh, next slide, the web format is very, very different. You know, you look at how users browse the web, you look at what they search for, you look, look at the experience that they expect. All of those things change user behavior, it changes how people search, how they interact in that environment. Um, now compare, right? What looks more like the App Store? If you think visually about, and from a UI and UX perspective, how Apple and Google build their stores, they look a lot more like Amazon.com than they do the web as well. Um, and so that should be a cue in terms of how you execute an optimization and think about building presence in the store. One, uh, search optimization is incredibly powerful. In fact, one of the things that we hear is that search optimization is harder and a lot of people tend to tilt their efforts toward conversion optimization and creative optimization with ASO, because for some people the results can be more tangible more quickly. But you know, the reality is, you know, search is extremely valuable. And if you execute it the right way, it can be just as powerful as conversion optimization. And it's it's something that you can do for a long time. You know, it's not just kind of a once and done activity. The more data and the more updates that you feed the store, the more you can build your relevancy. But it's important to realize, you know, for apps at scale, changing a couple of keywords doesn't make a difference. It's not about experimenting with one keyword at a time. It's about influencing hundreds of terms at a time. Um, and that's because Apple and Google look at your click-through rates and they use those click-through rates to understand where they might want to merchandise you on related audiences throughout the store. That's how merchandising works in the store. And so if search optimization isn't working for you, maybe, the data that you're using about what keywords to pick isn't correct. Um, maybe the way, the strategy that you're implementing or, or that you've been reading about uh, isn't taking into account how to influence merchandising in the store because you're just looking at one keyword at a time. Uh, and those things are, are very, very important. 
So one, you know, when you're thinking about search, keyword volumes are obviously extremely important. The problem is, if you look at the vast majority of tools out there, they're pulling data from web search or they're pulling data from Apple search ads uh, to get keyword volume information that they're presenting to you for ASO. And if you talk to Apple directly, you know, they will tell you, please do not use search ads data for ASO. And the reason that they do that is they say, well, you know, our search ads data is the time frame of the trends that we're reporting is very, very uh, short term. We're assuming that you can bid in a keyword very quickly. And if the keyword loses volume in a day, pull it back. You can't do that with ASO because Apple and Google take two or three weeks, sometimes a little longer, to fully index changes that you make in the App Store and Play Store on the organic side. On the web, when it comes to web data, there's only 20% overlap between web and mobile search trends. Um, literally, you know, the moment you inject web data into keyword scores, eight out of 10 of your keyword volume uh, recommendations are wrong. Uh, and so, you know, that can have a huge and, and a devastating impact on how big of an impact you can make from search optimization. So we always talk about search ads data and a great analogy for it is like day trading. You know, if you're on the stock market, uh, you can have a day trading strategy where you're looking for very short term trends to buy and sell during the day. That's kind of like what you do in paid search. Um, or you can look at long term strategies. Maybe you're looking to save for your retirement, right? And you're building a retirement portfolio in the stock market. Well, ASO is more like building a retirement portfolio. It's understanding the medium to long-term trends. It's understanding how, when you change your keywords and metadata, how that might affect Apple's merchandising or Google's merchandising of your app. It's not about day trading. Um, and, you know, that's one of the reasons that search ads data, frankly, is so toxic for ASO. Um, you know, it, it's not bad to look at. It's not bad to understand what's going on today in the short term in the App Store and Play Store, but you shouldn't ever literally take that data and use it to make choices. The other thing that's come up, and this was a conversation I literally had last week uh, with a client, uh, they were telling me that you know, some tool out there had impression and download data per keyword. And you know, one of the things that I think is, is very unfortunate uh, in our industry uh, is the lack of transparency about where data comes from. When someone says how many impressions a keyword has, the natural assumption that a, that a user is going to have is that that data is coming from the App Store or Play Store. That's what Apple and Google are telling you. Um, unfortunately, there's no asterisk next to where people include this data in their tools that says, hey, this data is not coming from the App Store and Play Store. In fact, it can't be because Apple and Google do not provide data about impressions and downloads per keyword. There is no API, there is no source of information that Apple and Google provide where a tool can pull that in. And so, you know, next question, how do tools do this? Well, it's important to understand how tools do this. First, a tool will track the keywords that you're targeting. And then it will take its understanding of volume for these keywords for the sake of conversation, let's call that high, medium, and low. And by the way, if, if those search volume estimates are wrong, that starts the math in a bad place. Uh, and then the tool will look at where you rank. Do you rank number one? Do you rank number 10? Do you rank number 100? And then it will scale, right? It'll have a, a, a you know, increment, you know, one through 10,000 for argument's sake. Uh, and based on where you rank, you'll get a percentage of that one through 10,000. And you know, a, a, a low volume keyword might only be able to max out at a 4,000 score. A high volume keyword would be a max out at a 10,000 score. And so you can see that this data is really just kind of made up mumbo jumbo, right? It's based on an, an interpretation of volume with however uh, you know, keyword, keyword rankings are being calculated and whatever scale they're being calculated on, on the back end of a tool. Um, it literally, in many cases, uh, you know, when you look at, 
even the basic data that you can get inside the Google um, Developer Console about what keywords are sending you traffic, 90% of the time doesn't match. So it's important to take these kind of estimates like a grain of salt. I think that, you know, and I would challenge any other tool out there to do this, that when data is not coming from the App Store and Play Store, and you're indicating uh, that, it, that it should be used for ASO, put an asterisk there. Tell the consumer, tell the user where the data comes from, tell the user how you're calculating it. Be transparent. Um, you know, at GunnyCube, we have a tool called DataCube. It uses machine learning. We're very transparent about the fact that we are pulling data in from the store, but we're using machine learning to calculate our values. Um, we always tell our clients that. Um, I think it's important to be very transparent uh, about how these kinds of estimates are being calculated uh, and not, uh, not simply imply that they're actually coming from Apple or Google. The other thing that uh, is important uh, is looking at difficulty scores. Um, a lot of people look at difficulty scores and you know, if you're looking at a tool, uh, you will find that um, a difficulty score for a keyword is the same for every app that you're looking at. And that's an indicator that the difficulty score is probably based on the number of apps competing for a keyword. When in fact, difficulty has nothing to do with the number of apps competing for a keyword. It has to do with your conversion on that keyword. If you convert very well on that keyword, uh, you will rank better than the other apps on the keyword. Uh, it's, it's a literal conversion uh, competition. Um, and so looking at difficulty in context of how many apps rank for a keyword is somewhat flawed. The other thing that's important to note is, and this is one of the things that we hear from a lot of developers, um, you know, they're, they're experimenting, changing with their keywords very frequently, or some people have even come to us and said, well, you know, we, we look at results from a keyword optimization after a few months because it takes a long time to get a read. You know, the reality is Apple and Google will index you for two to three weeks after you change your metadata. Um, we can detect that using our technology. That's how we know. Uh, and, you know, you usually can get a good readout in formal reports seven to 10 days after that indexation is completed. Um, if you're in a good position, you can do keyword metadata optimization about every 30 days and you should be able to get a solid view um, on how an optimization performed. So, you know, it's important to look at case studies in context. Um, this is an interesting case study. We, we do a lot of work with McAfee um, because this is an app that was optimized by another agency for, for a couple of years before we started working with it. Uh, and when we analyzed it, um, you know, we saw that some of the keywords uh, didn't have high volume that were, that were being targeted. Uh, we wanted to fix some, some connections between kind of audience target profiles uh, and the keywords or features that we wanted to highlight. Um, and, you know, we wanted to do a little bit broader targeting, right? You know, when, you, when you're working with a brand such as McAfee, you have the opportunity to really get merchandised in the store. So kind of doubling down on a single keyword doesn't, doesn't make a lot of sense. You want to get broad distribution. Um, using our methodology, and, and it is important to point out, doing this with no search ad spend, doing this with no paid support for this app, uh, we were able to achieve a 31% improvement in keyword visibility, a 27% in organic growth in organic impressions, and 10% uh, increase in app units at, at a fairly large scale. We also were able to bump conversion up by about 14% uh, uh, after you know, 60 days of working together. Um, so you know, this goes against two things. One, uh, broad-based optimization works, right? It's not about focusing on one keyword only. It's about getting Apple and Google to merchandise you. Two, uh, paid marketing can support organic success, but organic uh, success is not a pay-to-play model. Uh, there are a lot of people out there that say, well, just run an Apple search ads campaign. Well, the reality is that if you're not relevant, if you don't do your ASO and, and kind of build that foundation, Apple isn't gonna send you volume as part of a search ads campaign. Relevance is extremely important. 
So, you, you know, one, you can achieve great results without spending a lot of money on paid. And two, if you do want to run something like Apple search ads or Google UAC, ASO contributes to better results. So now we're kind of going to dive into it a little bit more. One, media buying and ASO are not the same thing. Um, you know, when you look at app store optimization and you think about the kind of chicken and egg scenario that exists between ASO and search ads, and, and by the way, the number one complaint that we hear from, from people with Apple search ads is they're targeting a high volume or high popularity keyword and they're not getting a lot of traffic. Well, that's because you have to do ASO first to increase relevancy for keywords. You have to build data within kind of the app store so Apple can understand what you're relevant for. ASO increases relevancy. It establishes your click and conversion data for a search ads campaign. It will open up more volume for search ads. We have seen as we've optimized apps running search ads campaigns that the more we optimize, uh, the more volume Apple will send you. Uh, and it will also drive down the cost of search ads as you improve relevancy. One thing a lot of people don't know is that Apple search ads does crawl descriptions. So when you're writing your description, even though that's not going to have an impact in your organic ASO, it will have an impact on search ads. Um, and you know, once you scale, once you have traffic, sure, search ads is going to improve your organic ranking. It's going to send extra click data into the store. But in order to get search ads to a point where it has enough volume to have a positive impact, you got to do your ASO work first. Um, also important to realize, you know, if you're talking to agencies, right, there's a big difference between an ASO agency and a media agency. You know, media agencies are compensated by how much you spend. Um, and so, you know, whenever you have someone tell you, oh, sure, we do ASO, uh, how much budget do you have for a search ads campaign? That's the wrong answer. You should just reject that. Um, now, on the flip side, search ads does have an impact. You know, we, we did a, a wonderful campaign for the folks at PBS Kids. They're, they're one of the, the largest uh, children's brands in North America. Uh, and, you know, after uh, several rounds of ASO, we, we launched ASA. And, and it helped us achieve two to three X faster indexation speed for keywords uh, and better rankings uh, throughout the store. It was truly supportive uh, of, of, the, uh, of the App Store optimization activity. Now, I talked a lot about search, but conversion is super important too. Uh, conversion optimization is important for a number of reasons that we'll get into. One, when you start the conversion optimization process, have a data-driven thesis, right? Make sure that you understand what's working in your category, what's working for your competitors. Are there features that have more organic demand or less organic demand to inform the order of the screenshots that you're going to place? among other things. Um, study what your competitors are doing and understand you know, whether the changes they've made have helped them or hurt them. Um, you know, conversion optimization shouldn't start with a process where you kind of feel like you're throwing spaghetti against the wall and seeing what sticks. Um, the other thing that's important to understand is that you know, Apple and Google have vastly different user experiences. Um, and, you know, with Apple, you can download practically from anywhere in the store. So it's important to think about the conversion optimization process in a way where you're not just focused on the store listing, where you're also focused on how you're competing for clicks in a competitive environment within search and the browse experience in the stores as well. So there are a lot of different tools for conversion optimization. And it's important to understand what the uh, advantages and disadvantages of each of these tools are. You know, we look at, you know, certainly Google experiments in the Google Play Store. We look at search ads creative set experimentation within, uh, within Apple search ads, which is valuable for top of the funnel read. Uh, and we, we also use external platforms. We have a platform called SplitCube. Uh, that allows us to create virtualized App Store and Google Play Store pages. You have to send some paid traffic in uh, to get a measurement of conversion. Um, but different platforms will give you uh, different results. Uh, and you know, it really depends on the source of traffic. It depends on what you're looking to test. You know, If you really want to test organic traffic in the store, you should be running your tests inside the store, uh, not using an external platform. And that's because 
paid and organic traffic don't behave the same way. It doesn't matter what people tell you. If you're running Facebook traffic to a conversion optimization platform, uh, that is not representative of the user experience in the App Store and Play Store, where people have to make a choice whether they want to download your app or someone else's. It's too much of a captive audience. So the way we think about A-B testing, use the tools in the store to optimize organic. Use external platforms to isolate a paid channel and improve your yield and improve your conversion and get learnings for that paid traffic. But don't assume that paid user behavior is going to be the same as organic user behavior. Now, uh, we have done a lot of case studies uh, on conversion optimization. One of our partners is Sephora. Uh, and I like this case study because it highlights one that, that actually metadata can have a significant impact on conversion, not just keyword optimization, which is important. The second thing it highlights is that subtle changes do matter. A lot of times you hear advice uh, from, from folks online, I won't say who, uh, that say, well, with creative, you've got to make like really big changes. It has to be dramatic, and that's the only way you get a read on uh, improvement. Well, that's not true. Um, a lot of people who say that are, are using external testing platforms. Uh, and uh, when, they, when they use external testing platforms, those platforms aren't as sensitive uh, to smaller changes. Um, and so, uh, you know, with Sephora, we were able to uh, go and we were able to do some changes on the short description. And when we did changes on the short description, we found variants that, just two, two sentences that we changed, two sentences in terms of positioning. Uh, we were able to improve conversion by between 14% and 44%. So, you know, this works not just for established apps, but also for apps that are new to the store. Um, and that's important to keep in mind. Um, you know, we've worked with companies that started with two to three employees all the way to thousands. You know, we're proud of our role in the ecosystem helping startups uh, as well as enterprise companies with ASO. Um, but you know, it's not about how much money you spend. It's about the tactics you use and, and the data that you use to make wise choices. Here's a case study from an app that was brand new to the store. It was in the game category, which is a very challenging category to enter without spending a lot of money. Um, and you know, we worked on both a strategy where you know, there was ASO, and we complemented that strategy uh, with paid marketing. So this is a great example of what happens when you align your ASO uh, in your App Store Optimus or in your Apple search ads. Uh, 524% improvement in top five keyword visibility. 193% improvement in organic search impression growth. 700% app unit growth uh, in the App Store. And 176% organic conversion growth. Now, this wasn't an app that was just launched. This wasn't the first optimization starting from zero. This app had been in the store for a while, uh, and we were able to uh, improve upon where it is. Uh, and this company was actually able to, to, to you know, raise its next round of financing uh, as a result of, of the optimization work that we did. So ASO has evolved a lot. Uh, you know, it's important to understand what methodologies work, what data works, and, and it's important to question everything that you see. Um, a lot of the advice that you see online can be somewhat uh, self-serving, uh, and, and it's important to kind of, kind of separate from the noise. Um, you know, if you haven't seen a lot of success uh, with ASO or with an aspect of ASO, uh, take a deep, deep look at the tools that you're using and evaluate whether they're correct, not whether the, the activity is valuable. Never settle. You know, if you've got 20% improvement in ASO with whatever techniques you're using, great. That's a great thing. But there's probably more that you can do. Um, and, and it's important to look at different ways of optimizing to get there. Anyway, thanks uh, everyone for, uh, uh, for joining. We're gonna get to uh, your Q&A right now. Um, and I know that uh, James has been sharing some polls uh, as well. Okay. Sorry yeah, about that. I know it can be very distracting having uh, polls going up, but uh, yeah, a bit of fun uh, during the uh, 
during the, the session. So uh, that was really great and given us some good um, kind of stuff to go on. We've already got uh, 10 questions um, and you have promised to get through all of them. So let's yes. see, we'll start. It'd be good if there's, I think the default here is anonymous. Yeah, it'd be good if people can use their name if they can. I know you, you've probably got to just make one extra click, but it's kind of nicer so, so we can sort of address it to you individually. There's a first question is, um, it's a kind of general question on, um, a kind, of, kind of more of a general UA question. Maybe we'll, we'll deal with that later. So, um, well, someone's asking, hi there, Dave, what are the best practices for picking keywords and strategy for the keywords field or description? Let's say one for each new app and one that has already 20K downloads a day. What's the difference in strategies? Uh, that's a really good question. So uh, I think the simple answer to that question is when you have a new app, uh, the goal is to, is to build relevancy. And the goal is to focus on what your core keyword is going to be or what your core set of keywords are going to be that are related to the features of the app. And then look at what the related phrases are associated with those features. When you first launch an app, if it's in a high volume category, the, the very high volume keywords uh, are going to require some click data and some history for you to rank very well for. And so what you wanna do is you wanna understand what the related phrases are you want to target those phrases, not directly, but by looking at what words combine to build those phrases and build out a footprint that's as large as you possibly can with the terms that are related to your core, to your core keywords and core features. Those, those phrases are gonna index faster. And when those phrases index faster, Apple is going to gather click data that's valuable for the core terms because Apple and Google while they do look at one keyword at a time from a, a conversion perspective, they are considering what the related audiences are and what the related keywords are. That's how they merchandise you through the store. Uh, so uh, initially, go after the related terms. Once you're, once you're live and once you start to see those index, what I would do is I would start to double down a little bit, perhaps with a search ads by uh, on some of the higher volume keywords to drive extra clicks into them uh, and gradually uh, improve your set of conversion data on that keyword uh, over time or on those target keywords over time. I think for an app that already has 20,000 downloads per day uh, in your question, uh, go big, right? There's no reason that an app can't rank for, you know, with a, with a good optimization strategy, you know, a couple thousand keywords, right? Uh, you know, look at everything you rank for, uh, look at the themes where, you know, maybe you're ranking well, you know, the top 10 or top 20, but not, not, you know, number one, um, and start building out a footprint, uh, you know, looking at keywords, looking at phrases that will be a little bit broader in terms of how you target. Um, and, and don't be afraid of going after the high volume keywords. At the end of the day, an app that has 20,000 downloads per day has a lot of history. It has a lot of click through rate data. And so, you know, if we target the keywords correctly, if we go for a broad optimization, we start feeding Apple and Google more data. Once we feed Apple and Google more data, then we really have to think about conversion optimization at a keyword level. I mean, if you have a perfect keyword metadata optimization and you're still struggling to get out of the top 20 uh, on, on a keyword that's important to you, that's a click-through rate issue, not a metadata issue that needs to be solved. And very specific question here. How many keywords is the maximum for the long description on Google Play Store? Well, there's, uh, there's technically not a maximum number of keywords on the Google Play Store. The way that we tend to think about, so let me back up for a moment. When we think about how many keywords can we stuff into a description, I think that's the wrong way to think about it. I think the right way to think about it is what core keywords are we targeting? And what are the phrases related to those keywords that have a similar audience? Uh, and we look at placement throughout the description or the short description or the title in a way where, where the phrases you're targeting are directly related uh, and they're supportive of the core keywords that you want to rank for. Because you want to feed Google not just individual keywords. You want to feed Google context because the algorithm that the, the Google Play Store uh, uses to crawl your description is also about context. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. Got it. And someone's talking about um, 
feedback from the app store if you're ranking for say number 50 on one keyword last month today you're ranking 20 is that a good sign that you you know the keywords getting a lot of downloads that are relevant to the app and you should then keep focusing on it you know conversely if you you're 50 a month ago but it's not really moving much maybe going up to 45 does that mean it's not a relevant keyword that's a good question. So when you're increasing in rank on a keyword, particularly a high volume or a competitive keyword, uh, it is a sign you are converting better on that keyword. So uh, for whatever you know reason, maybe you updated your app, maybe you changed your creative or your description, maybe your competitors changed their creative and it didn't work out so well for them, but it's a measure of click-through rate. And so going from 50 to 20 means that your click-through rate, your conversion on that keyword improved. Uh, and that means that one, if you target other related terms, you'll probably rank fairly well for them uh, faster than others. It also means that, you know, once you kind of get into that top 10, top 20 uh, ranking, uh, evaluate, are other people advertising on that keyword? Because sometimes, you know, it can be harder to crack, you know, into the top 10 from top 20 or from the top 10 to the top five on a keyword, simply because it's super competitive. And if a lot of people are buying search ads of all, uh, uh, inventory, they're adding clicks uh, to that keyword, adding essentially artificial conversion. And so uh, I would say top 20 it would be a great outcome to climb to. It's a conversion uh, uh, um, uh, kind of success story. Um, but, but how do we get from 20 uh, higher, right? And you know, how can we influence that? And, and those are kind of the next steps. Someone's asking about Explore. I believe that's Google Play, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're saying, well, what's, what's the connection between um, the, the, the general sort of uh, Google Play um, browse versus Explore? You know, how they're, they're going up in, in, in uh, the sort of core uh, store listings, but down in Explore. You know, what, what's that all about? So there are actually two algorithms in the App Store and Play Store. There's one that governs search, and there's a separate one that governs browse or explore activity, uh, depending on the store that you're looking at. Um, search activity is governed entirely by, uh, you know, call it the foundation you build with the keywords you target in your metadata. That kind of is your qualification, telling Apple and Google, hey, I'd like to rank for these keywords. Uh, and, you know, ultimately your ranking depends on how you convert for those keywords. So click-through rate, conversion, and relevancy is a big part of what drives success in search. Um, you know, in, in addition to kind of getting your metadata right, targeting the right keywords. Um, with Browse and Explore, it's about, to some, to some extent, volume and velocity, right? You're going to get in more lists, and you're going to get higher in chart rankings by having higher volume and velocity in the store. But volume and velocity is not going to have a huge impact on your search rankings. It may have an impact on indexation time. Like for example, Apple and Google will crawl your app a whole lot faster if you have some traffic hitting the page, but that's not necessarily the same as ranking better for a keyword. So think about indexation and ranking separately, search volume, which might drive, or not search volume, download volume, which might drive you know, better browser explorer activity, could cause Apple and Google to index you faster, but that's not the direct driver of better rankings. Better, better click-through rate, better relevancy is a driver of better rankings. Great, another keyword question. Um, what um, should you should you focus on uh, keywords where you're ranking higher than a hundred? They're saying between let's say thirty and eighty, and your aim being to get in the top thirty, and then try and get to the top. I guess you know sort of three or, or one percent they're saying um you know is that is that a good strategy uh so that's uh, that's a good question um i'm just uh reading it in more yeah. detail right now so generally speaking um i, I don't necessarily uh agree with the concept of choosing between one keyword or another or uh, uh, kind of looking at this in a linear way where where you're saying well if I'm in the top hundred or if I'm in the top ten what should I focus on the way that I tend to view these things is 
Um, what keywords are relevant to the features of your app and how many features do you have? Uh, what are the core terms? What are the phrases related to those features? And how can we build an optimization that, that over time feeds relevancy uh, to, those, to those features? Um, when you're thinking about uh, you know, ranking in the top 100 for a keyword, um, it's important to, one, think about conversion. If you're already ranked for that keyword and you're, you're struggling to get out of the top 100, how do, we, how do we convert better for those keywords? What's working from a creative standpoint uh, for the apps that are ranking for that keyword? And, and for the apps that are ranking well for that keyword, do they even have an overlap with the features that I'm targeting? Uh, and if they do, focus on conversion optimization. Um, you know, with Apple and Google, when you're doing metadata optimization, you know, every time you update your keywords in metadata is not just another bite at the Apple, it's an opportunity to get Apple and Google to crawl you and a chance to expand your spider web of keywords uh, that you rank for based on how they're going to merchandise you. It's not a game where, you know, you, you look at the keywords that you're targeting and only track those keywords or other things going on. Um, so, you know, we, we, we try to look at it kind of from a broader perspective and we also look at it when you're looking at, you know, making a choice between one keyword and another based on your rankings, am I relevant for those keywords? You know, if you're not relevant for a keyword, you can discard it. You know, if you find out that people searching for that keyword are predominantly not downloading apps that are like yours, you can discard it. That's an easy choice. But if they are, try to address the conversion issue. Got it. And um, related to that, a little break from the keywords questions. If you've got, Oksana is asking, if you've got multiple sources of traffic um, with different um, CVRs, I think, does that conversion rate, on Google Play, how would you read the result of an A-B test? Yeah, that's a good, that's a, that's a good question. Um, and that's one of the reasons that we look at A-B testing using multiple techniques Right. Um, and so, you know, one, if you're A-B testing on the Google Play Store, um, uh, you're going to get a read of, of traffic across all your pages when you're, when you're running those tests. Um, generally speaking, uh, what we do is, you know, we will go uh, find, you know, creative that, that converts well, that's successful on that page uh, after running an A-B test. And if we choose to deploy it, we'll actually then go and look at every channel through an attribution tool and see how conversion for every channel has been impacted uh, after, after that change to make sure we understand kind of channel granularity. No creative decisions ever permanent. If we have to roll back, we can do that. The other thing is that there are different tools that you want to use for different purposes, right? So, um, you know, generally speaking, we'll look at the, the Google experiments tool inside Google Play as a great way to test all traffic on your page. We'll look at creative sets and search ads as a great way to test search. And then we use a tool like SplitCube where you have kind of virtualized app store or Google Play page that you drive paid traffic into to measure results. Um, and if you're really concerned about how to measure conversion for a particular paid channel, um, the external testing tools like SplitCube are the best ones to use because you can isolate that traffic before you make any changes in the store. Um, I would never use an external testing tool to evaluate organics because it's not the same. But if, you're, if, you're, if your concern is paid traffic, that might be, that's probably a good option. Right, and Matthew's asking to clarify, we had a poll on this. Um, the number of days you recommend before you judge um, whether a keyword optimization works both on uh, Google Play or in the App Store. Uh, okay, so I have to apologize. Uh, internet issue, you broke up there. Would you mind repeating that? Yeah, sure. So Matthew is asking, can you clarify, uh, we had a poll on this as well, how many days you recommend before you judge whether a keyword ah. optimization works on on both platforms? So on, yeah, is there any difference in that between Google or, or uh, Play or um, the App Store? Thanks for that. So um, Apple generally crawls keywords and metadata faster. Uh, you can generally be confident that Apple and Google have finished crawling your changes in uh, 14 to 21 days, two to three weeks. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer. Uh, with Google, uh, it can be you know four or five weeks. It's, it, the, the tail is a little bit longer, sometimes six weeks. Um, so Google, you know, try to try to let it crawl for about 45 days before you make changes. 
by the way, this is this is really an, an important question because you know if you're being told you can't get a read for months and months and months, that's a fuzzy answer. The reality is you should be able to get a read, uh, you know, after 30 to 45 days in both stores at maximum. Uh, and uh, you know whether that read is you had a big success or that that read is some of the keywords you were targeting didn't work out so well. Maybe they're not ranking very well and, and you need to optimize their conversion. That's still good data to have. Great. And if Ivan is asking, what about the IAP keywords for iTunes or the App Store? What's their weight compared to that of other metadata or keywords? How important is it to have them? It's a good practice uh, to use uh, the IAP metadata from a from a keyword standpoint. Uh, you know, we don't think that they have more value than keywords that you would plug in your description or your title. Um, and, and by the way, this is actually a very good question. Uh, so, uh, you know, when you think about the, the weight or the value of keywords in the Apple App Store in particular, um, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, your title and subtitle are most valuable, followed by your keyword field and then everything else. The reality is the reason user-facing metadata that is also leveraged by Apple to determine keywords tends to perform best is because users who are searching for those keywords see your app. They see the keyword visually on your store listing in your metadata, and they convert because they know you have what you're looking for and higher conversions lead to better rankings. So it's not that the title or subtitle or any other piece of metadata is more valuable. It's that certain metadata fields are also conversion areas as well. Got it. And uh, someone's asking, is there any sort of limit or optimum number of apps to have in one uh, Google Play Store account, or does it not matter? Uh, well, we haven't, we haven't necessarily seen a limit on, on you know, how many apps is good to have versus how many apps are bad to have in, in a Google Play Store account. Um, I, I think it's important that, you know, as you build a larger portfolio, uh, that you evaluate, uh, you know, how you are treating your uh, premier apps or the ones that are driving the most traffic. Um, because certainly Google and Apple have implemented policies over the last 12 to 18 months to cut down on developers who are just kind of, you know, launching a large number of apps, hoping they float to the top and kind of scrape the cream off the top of the app store. I've heard stories of, of developer accounts being deleted because the apps don't add value, all sorts of things like that. So I would say, you know, if you have a hundred apps as an example, and the 80, 20 rule applies, 20% of them are the most important for you. Uh, you might, you might want to segregate those. You might want to protect those because Apple and Google are getting more and more toward the orientation of kind of, you know, cleaning up their stores and making sure that only the best is in there. Great. And um, Vandana wants to know if there's any free tools for, for keyword um, analysis of, on the ASO. Yeah, that's a good question. So there are free tools uh, that are out there, uh, but the problem is a lot of the free tools, heck, even a lot of the paid tools, uh, the data is wrong. You know, most of the free tools out there are pulling in data from the web. Most of the tools that are low cost but paid are pulling in data from Apple search ads. Um, and so it, it can be tough. You know, is it, is it better than doing nothing? Sure, it's better than doing nothing. But I think you have to calibrate your mind when you're looking at data from a free tool to understand where does the data come from? How do I compensate for kind of what may be the flaws in this data set. And, and at the end of the day, you know, what I always tell people, and we talk to a lot of independent developers uh, who just want advice because we want to help the community. You know, I always tell people, you know, perhaps better than being misinformed by a tool with bad data, you know, go in, look at the features of your app, start to run a search inside the App Store and Play Store for some of those features, look at the type in recommendations, and use that as your launch board. Because at the end of the day, you want to get as close to true data from the App Store and Play Store as possible and reject data that's coming from other places. Got it. This, this seems to come up quite a lot. The question, is it better to have keywords, your main keywords, in the first part of your description? They're not state, um, does that help in better ranking? 
It can. Uh, you know, certainly uh, when you look at uh, the way that Google would, be, we're talking about Google Play, I'm assuming, but when, when you look at the way that Google crawls a description, you know, they are going to be crawling the first part of your description uh, uh, soonest. Uh, but, but here's the thing, right? With a Google Play description, the format of your description can actually be more important of where you place keywords. You know, if you place keywords inside a, a thick, dense paragraph, it's going to take Google longer contextually to figure out which keyword is important, even if you place it in the front. Uh, versus if you kind of structure things in other ways that are easier to crawl. Now, you're always balancing, you know, user experience and conversion versus kind of how the machine is going to crawl your page. And, and certainly I understand that. Um, but, but that's the way we usually uh, uh, view that. We, you know, where you place and how much you kind of repeat a keyword is not as important as the structure and whether you're making it easy for Google to crawl you if your goal is quick indexation and rankings. Got it. This is an interesting question from Eve, which is, um, should you start your a, um, ASO on a specific uh, geography um, before, before rolling out globally, as you might do with, yeah, a sort of, I guess, yeah, Facebook does with a new feature launch or something? Uh, so, you know, when it comes to choosing how to uh, roll out your App Store optimization, uh, I think that answer might be different depending on your goals uh, and kind of what your app is and who the target audience is, it, who the target audience is. It is. Um, you know, what I would say is that when you're launching an app, uh, you know, Apple and Google are just starting their learning process about your app. And it takes time uh, for Apple and Google to understand what your features are, what you're relevant for, to gather click data from end users. Um, and so, you know, I would say, you know, for ASO, unless you're doing like a private beta or unless you're doing a soft launch in one territory, in which case you're only going to focus on that territory, uh, you know, I would say get your metadata in there as early as possible for wherever you want distribution because there is going to be some spin up time uh, as, as Apple and Google uh, learn about your app and, and you know, why, why delay that? Again, I know a lot of game publishers, a, a lot of big studios, uh, have a process where they do a beta launch in New Zealand or Australia or Canada or one of these territories first, in which case, yeah, just, just work on those territories because you don't want to expand distribution where you're not promoting. But, but if you're launching your app, uh, you know, optimize everywhere you can. Feed Apple and Google as much nutrition as you can so that you get the best results. Got it. And Dobromir is asking, so you've been advocating, Dave, for broad um, keyword strategy. He's saying if we're changing our keywords in the metadata, are you, is, is he going to lose the, the ranking for, for his old keywords? And if you're happy with you know, your current results, is it still a good idea to, to try and rotate more keywords, feed more uh, data to, to Google and Apple? Even for apps that are very, very large, and I'm talking about some of the, the top 10 apps in, in the categories of the App Store and Play Store, and they rank very well for many of their core features, we are still changing a selection of keywords every 30 days because Apple and Google, uh, when they're crawling your app, uh, essentially, from, from the data that we've seen, have kind of this linear degradation in the value that they see for, for older keywords and metadata. Essentially, you know, if you're doing really well today and you're happy with your optimization and you stop making incremental changes and, and, and experiments, uh, and then your competitors are, are updating their keywords and metadata every 30 days, Apple and Google will start to see you as less relevant than them because your metadata and your optimization is more stale. And that linear degradation uh, in mobile happens much faster than the web if you stop updating content for a website. So one, it's important to have a cadence of updates. Two, it's important to understand where you're doing well throughout the store, right? Is, is there a feature that has a core keyword and other phrases that you're ranking on versus another feature with a core keyword and the phrases it ranks on and, and where you're converting best. And we usually look at, at that conversion metric. We say, well, what keywords are we converting best on? Because a lot of times if you convert really well on a keyword and you know, then you uh, 
remove that keyword, you will actually continue to rank for it. And you'll see that if you continue to track that keyword. Um, some people who are a little nervous about that kind of back up that action with a small search ads buy uh, to continue to add clicks to that keyword and ensure it doesn't go away. Um, but you know, we, we, don't, we don't view this as an either or when we're doing optimization. Got it. Robert has a chess app called Chess Universe, and he's saying to do this kind of broad strategy you're talking about, how might that work with, with his sort of app? He's, he's asking if chess, chess pieces, chess champions, how, how should he, I guess it's kind of hard to be a bit specific with chess without knowing it, but how should he approach this kind of broad uh, keyword strategy? Yeah, um, I'm familiar with Chess App. Uh, you know, I think that um, you know when we look at when we look at a broad strategy for an app like that, obviously there are going to be core keywords that are very uh, important for that app. What we want to do is we want to understand uh, all of the variations and themes that users could search for. We want to look at all the competitors users could search for. We want to look at all the components of the app. You know, as as you know, Robert said chess pieces, rules of chess, chess champions, Kasparov, these kind of themes, because uh, those kind of themes have a similar audience behind them. And Apple and Google understand the concept of similar audience. So the more clicks that we can drive, not just to keywords, but keywords that are related to each other, uh, you will be able to even improve the core terms that you're targeting over time. Um, you know, with an app like Chess App, you know, there, there's no reason that you can't rank for a thousand keywords. Uh, it's just a matter of creating a cadence of updates and understanding kind of which clusters of keywords, you know, to stimulate with each update without losing what you have. Great. And we did promise we would cover all the questions and we just about got time within the hour. So. Excellent. Matthew is asking, so well done, Dave, and thanks for keeping going. Matthew is asking um, the question about competitor brand terms in the iOS keyword string. Is that a good or bad idea? Um, so, you know, certainly there are some brands that we work with that, that just don't want to target uh, their competitors there. And, and we understand that. There, there are some decisions there. Here's the thing. When, when Apple reviews your submission, uh, whether your app is approved and those keywords do start ranking is up to the individual reviewer who happens to look at your app. And so in a world that is relative, where uh, you know an, an individual at Apple is deciding whether to let it go or not, and, and the vast majority of times they do, uh, and your competitors are certainly targeting uh, you know, other brands, uh, if you want to be competitive, uh, you, you should probably try that. Now, we wouldn't recommend targeting brands that have nothing to do with your app. We wouldn't recommend being spammy. But, but if there is legitimate relevance, and if your app appearing on that keyword would provide a good user experience uh, for people browsing the app store, uh, you know, there's a chance that, that, that you may already rank for the keyword and not know it because Apple may have merchandised you there, right? So I would say, try it, but take into consideration the fact that you know, if you have a very strict reviewer, they, they might ghost that keyword, they might not let it rank. It's possible you could get a metadata rejection. It would probably happen one out of every 30 or 40 times you do a submission on, on average. Uh, but, but the vast majority of people uh, do opt to target competitors. That's interesting. Um... And Stan, final question, Dave, is asking, um, do you need to repeat um, important keywords in the description? They've got an established app. It's got doing pretty well, very well. In fact, 40 to 50K installs a day. Do they need to repeat keywords? Um, if you repeat keywords in a description, I would say do so because it's valuable to the end user or natural in context of what you're writing. Again, uh, the description in our, in our view is more about uh, how you structure it, the way it is physically structured and written, more than just kind of repeating keywords over and over again. Right. Well, that's brilliant, Dave. Before anyone else asks a question, I think we'll cut it off there. 
We had some really great feedback on uh, this session today. Ian Russell said, that this is great stuff, Dave. It's like myth, myths busters. And we've had some other good comments. Anthony Robinson said, brilliant presentation, Dave. It's the best I've seen on ASO, and I've seen a few. Dobram is saying, Dave, you're awesome. Thank you for sharing so much useful info. Matthews, thanks, Dave. Montserrat, great presentation. So uh, I think everyone's pretty happy. Valuable insights, says Andrew. So thanks for, for joining us today. Really appreciate it. And thanks everyone who's, who's asked some questions as well. That really made it great. And uh, I know it's a bit late for a lot of people on the European or UK time zone, but really glad you could join us today. And, and thanks to Dave. So Dave, where can people find out more or follow up with you? Um, I guess go to Gummy Cube site, which I shared earlier, or? Yeah, absolutely. So we're at gummycube.com, G-U-M-M-I-C-U-B-E.com. We're also on Twitter at GummyCube, LinkedIn at GummyCube. Um, but, you know, if you'd like to reach out, I'm always happy to have a conversation, uh, whether, you know, you just need advice or, or if you're looking for some help. Uh, my email is really simple. It's dbell at gummycube.com. You can also reach out to us at info at gummycube.com. Uh, and we're more than happy to chat. You know, we view this as a, as a community and, and, you know, we are here to help, uh, and, uh, you know, don't, don't be shy. Great. All right. Thanks again, Dave. And, uh, I hope you have a brilliant day. Thank you very much.